Hi guys, it's Alicia with Good Morning Sunshine. I know I haven't been on in a while. Um, I had a horrible week of finals right before break and then of course break was about a month long. So I haven't made a video since then. But now we're on to second semester of vet school. Um, I think we're on day 81 today of like actual vet school classes or days. Um, but we started moving today, so that's our next class. Um, so we had four lectures today. One was an um, orientation lecture of the course, and then we started um, anatomy. So um, so we had anatomy one today and anatomy two, and then we went into microanatomy, so muscle physiology, I think it was. Um, but I'm going to start with anatomy one, and then move into anatomy two, and then move into microanatomy. So we started with um, the osteology and arthrology of the thoracic limb. Um, so basically she wants us to know um, spelling, spelling counts in these like brachy versus brachy. So brachy with I versus brachy with a Y and then anti and anti and know how to spell humorous, you know, instead of humorous. Um, but anyways, starting, uh, we started with flexion and extension, um, going over things we learned in like the normal animal from before. Um, so flexion means to decrease the flexion angle, um, and extension means to increase the flexion angle. So, um, extending, um, there. So basically, I wish I could just turn around and show you stuff, but anyways. So we have different flexion angles. So this is a flex carpus. So you're moving your hand down like that. And then extend is out, if that makes sense. And then we got it in the flexor surfaces of the thoracic limb joints. So only the elbow faces cranially for flexors. Um, so flexor angles in the thoracic limb, again, all face um, caudally except for the elbow. Um, so this the elbow actually faces cranially. Um, so that, but the extensors, um, face cranially except for the elbow. So it's the opposite of your, um, flexors. Um, so directional terminology, we have high to low, which means proximal to distal. Um, so proximal means like towards the back of the dog. Um, so up here, um, and then distal is towards the toe of the animal. Um, but we have to remember that proximal and distal are relative terms. Um, so the elbow is distal to the shoulder. So like in this picture, the elbow here is distal to the shoulder. So it means it's below it, but then, um, but it's proximal. The elbow is proximal to the carpus. So that's above it, if that makes sense in that way. And then more directional terminology. We have um, front to back. Um, the carpus is a big divider. Carpus meaning like wrist um, in lamer terms. Um, but shoulder to the carpus or wrist, uh, we use cranial and caudal, um, those terms. But once we pass the carpus, we're going to use palmar, which means towards the palm and dorsal. Um, the wife can convention, we also have medial to lateral. Um, medial is with our thumb, where our thumb is. This is our um, digit number one. And then lateral is our pinky. So medial is like toward us and then laterals away from us. And then we have differences, um, carnivore versus like equine and ruminants. So canines, um, felines um, versus um, horses and cows or ruminants. Um, so the differences, um, so the fewest approximately starting with the scapula, but then it increases distally. Um, and then now we're going to get into the osteology of the thoracic limb. So basically she said our hand is our built-in cheat sheet on our test. Um, again, we want to be the dog. That's what she says. So toes down. So this is how dogs um, step. Um, so our palms are down, our hands are down. <clears throat> In that way. So again, domestic animals do not have a clavicle except for felines, so except for our cats. So the shoulder is um, composed of one bone. Um, that would be your scapula here, up here. And then we have our brachium, which is also one bone, and that is our humerus here. Um, and then our antibrachium is distal to the elbow, so from here on 
right there, that is our antibrachium. Our antibrachium um, consists of the radius and the ulna, so two bones. Um, and again, the antibrachia is the next one down here. So getting into the antibrachium, we're going to start with the radius. It's more lateral um, approximately and going distally, it crosses medially. So when you turn, I'll show you in a second. It is the weight-bearing bone of the antibrachium in all species. Um, so I wish I could show you, but anyways. So here's your thumb, right? And this is where your radius is. So radius is most medial because um, it goes with your thumb, your first digit. And then our ulna is on our pinky side over here. If that makes sense. Um, so then our ulna is more medial proximately, but crosses laterally going distally. So again, it's lateral as it goes towards the wrist here. Um, this is our not weight bearing um, in any of our species. Um, the radius and ulna are complete in dogs and in cats. Um, but um, when we get into equine and like ruminants, it's um, usually fused together. And then we got into supination. Supination is when your palm side is um, up. So up like this, this is supination. Um, and then pronation is when um, the palm side is down like this. Um, and then when getting into the manus, um, this includes your wrist. So our carpus, our metacarpus and our digits. So it includes our wrist, our palm and our digits in lamer terms. Um, the carpus um, has usually two rows of bones, so this is our wrist. Um, they have proximal and distal bones. Um, articulations, there's too much to count, um, but there's typically four bones in each of these two rows, um, but it also, again, it varies with the species. Um, the distal row is numbered, whereas the proximal row is named. So I'm going to show you right here. So our proximal row, like I said, are named. So we have our intermedial radial we have our ulnar, we have our accessory, but when we get into our distal carpal bones, we have one, two, three, and four here. And again, remember one begins with the thumb. So again, there's potentially eight bones. So again, four in each row of the carpus, um, but again, it varies on species. And like I said, the proximal row is named and the distal row is numbered. <coughs> So now getting into the metacarpus, um, we have a set from one to five long bones between the carpus and digits. Um, again, there's not always five, um, but when we're talking about dog and feline, there's usually five. Um, but when we get to equine and ruminants, again, there's like two and one. Um, the metacarpus um, long bones is a set number. Like I said, it varies with species. Um, the metacarpus um, creates the palm of the manus um, and it's between the carpus and the digits. Um, so these are our metacarpals in this red box here. And again, they're, they are numbered as well. And again, the thumb starts at one and then we go two, three, four, and five. So we have one thumb and four fingers. And then we have the base and the head of the metacarpal bone. She said we didn't really need to know this, but we know, need to know that they're backwards. So the top is the actually the base, whereas the head is um, the bottom. So base means proximal, whereas the head means um, distal here. So again, we have four um, fingers and a thumb, us as humans, as well as dogs and cats. Um, dogs and cats have five, like I said, including fingers and the thumb. The digit one, so the thumb is medial. Um, each digit has multiple small bones. Um, these are called phalanges. Um, that's the pearl name. Um, phalanx um, is the singular name. It's not phalange. Um, so we want to be the claw. So she said to make our hand into a claw. Um, this is how we differentiate between how many phalanges we have. So again, the thumb is the one that has two phalanges, whereas all the fingers have three. So again, digit one is the thumb, has two phalanges, has a proximal and distal. Um, so it has a proximal phalanx and then um, a distal one. And then digits two through five, they have a proximal, middle, and distal um, phalanx. 
Um, the distal phoenix is highly modified um, across species, so it's very species specific. Um, but now getting into the skeletal movements of the manis, it's very complex. So the antibrachial carpal um, is used to flex and extend. Um, the inner carpals are used um, have a small amount of sliding, so that in the wrist. Um, and then our carpal metacarpals, um, they're used to flex and extend, but also as to abduct and adduct. Um, and then we have our metacarpophalangeal, um, which flex and extend, and then our interphalangeal also flex and extend here. And then the axis of the manis here. Our axis is the purple line going down. It's between um, digits 2 and 3. Sorry, it's between digits three and four. I take that back. Um, and axial means closer to the axis. So this red line here, that's axial to the axis of the manis. And then we have um, abaxial, which is farther, which is this blue line from the axis here. Um, joints of the thoracic limb. Um, we have to know both anatomical and common names. So for shoulder, we have to know shoulder, but we also have to know what's called the scapular humeral joint. Um, and then for elbow, we have to know what's called the humeral radial ulnar joint. So basically you have to um, include all the bones um, um, in order for to, it to be the anatomical name. You use all the bones. And then we have our antibrachiocarpal, middle carpal, intercarpal, carpal, metacarpal, which is our carp, <laughs> our carpus, meaning our wrist. And then our metacarpal phalangeal, um, which are our knuckles um, in humans. Um, major joints of the thoracic limb, like I said, we have our shoulder, we have our elbow, we have our carpal joints down here, and then we have our digital joints. So starting with the shoulder, it's relatively simple because it's just two bones, um, but this joint, hey, stop. It's just grandma. Anyways, um, just two bones. So we have our glenoid and then our humerus. So this, of course, joint would be called glenohumeral here. And then we have the elbow, which is more complex. Um, it contains three bones um, with three separate names. So we have humoral radial, humoral ulnar, and our radial ulnar joints um, because of all the different bones here. And then we have the ancaneal process of the ulna, um, which is gonna probably be on our lab exam. Um, it's a, the beak part of the ulna, which I can show you here, I guess. This looks like a beak here. Um, it's named separately because it was a separate bone but became um, ossified. Um, it's easy to break off and it's very pointy, um, which would make it very painful if it broke off as well. Um, the ulna also has the coronoid process, so medial and lateral, um, coronoid meaning crown. Um, it's easy to fragment these processes also, um, usually the me medial one, um, the body weight comes down on the medial side of the limb. This is why this is um, more easily to fragment here. And these are our lateral and medial coronoid processes. Um, the medial one is usually also bigger. Then we have the carpal region, um, which includes many subjoints. Um, the carpus is actually used as a collective term for um, all of these. Um, all the joints put together. Um, the antibrachial carpal joint is between the radius and ulna and the carpal bones. So that would be right here. This is the antibrachial um, carpal joint. And then we have the middle carpal, which is between the proximal and distal roll, uh, rows of the carpal bones. So these are between uh, right here. This one's the next one. This would be our middle carpal. And then we have our inner carpal joint, which is in between these, in between the individual carpal bones. And then we have the carpal metacarpal um, joint, which is the next line here. And then getting into, again, more of the carpal regions. Um, I showed you this already, but again, antibrachial, so you can see the arrows here, and then the middle joint, of course, and then the intercarpals, and then the carpo uh, metacarpal joint there. Now getting into the digital reading, so our toes. Um, again, 
it's very complex. Um, we have a metacarpal phalangeal joint, um, which are these, um, because they're between the metacarpals, um, and the phalanges, so that's why it's called the metacarpal, um, phalangeal joints. And then we have the interphalangeal, um, joint as well, which is this one, um, it's on the thumb, on digit one. Um, but then digits two through four, they have a proximal interphalangeal joint and a distal interphalangeal joint, which are um, these two down here. And then getting to joint capsules of the thoracic limb, um, as synovial joints, each major joint in the limbs is provided with a joint capsule. Um, details of the synovial joint um, structure, um, we're going to get covered elsewhere, so she didn't um, go into it much. Um, but the synovial joint, ha again, has a joint capsule, and it contains synovial fluid. Um, the fluid's usually clear, um, but it can get infected or inflamed, which would change the color of the fluid here, which it can come in all these different colors. But we would get a fluid sample, um, so that's called an arthrocentesis, in order to check that out. Um, some complex joints are to provide multiple individual capsules. Um, some of these may or may not communicate with each other. Um, and then we went into obtaining joint fluid. Like I said, they can, it's supposed to be clear, but can come in many colors um, due to inflammation and infection. Um, so we want to bend the joint or flex the joint here in order to get the fluid out. So here we have our radiocarpal joint, and then we have our middle carpal joint, and then we have our carpal metacarpal joint. Um, when we flex the area, um, the radiocarpal joint and the middle carpal joint um, open up so we can get fluid there or collect fluid there. But the carpal metacarpal joint, we are unable to get fluid there. But that's okay because the middle carpal joint and the carpal metacarpal joint um, work together, they communicate together. So it's okay. Um, so again, here we would take a needle and then get the fluid out of where those um, joints opened up. So getting into more ligaments of the thoracic limb, the, just the basics, every hinge joint, um, which is distal to the shoulder, um, they have collateral ligaments, so they have a medial and lateral. Um, at each joint, um, basically longitudinal bundles of co um, collagenous fibers um, in the superficial layer of the joint capsule pass passing um, from the bone proximal to the joint to the bone distal to it. Um, so basically hinge joint is distal to the shoulder is provided with collateral ligaments on medial and on both the medial and lateral side um, and they prevent it from going too far medially or too far laterally. So we have many um, <clears throat> collateral ligaments in all these different areas here. So again, um, to name them, we would say it's a collateral ligament and then name um, what joint it's at. Also, you want to um, name if it's medial or lateral as well. <clears throat> Here's a better picture. So this is a lateral collateral ligament. This is what they look like. They usually go straight up and down, but however, they can have um, separate bundles on the sides as well. <clears throat> and then for the shoulder, um, we have different ligaments. We have a lateral and medial um, glenohumeral ligaments, um, <clears throat> which you can see here. So we have lateral on this side and the medial on this side. <clears throat> And this is what supports the joint or um, supports the muscle. And then we also have annular ligaments. Um, this is for the elbow. Um, the annular ligament of the elbow supports the rotary um, action of the head of the radius against the radial notch of the ulna. And then we got into anatomy too after that. So we got into species specific osteology of the manus. So, again, that includes the wrist, um, the palm, and our digits. <clears throat> so, the manis starts with the carpus, like I said, and goes to the toes. Um, the horse's manis is very long, whereas the dog and cat manis is very short. 
So look how small the dog and cat one is. And then the, that's the horse's one. So again, it varies among species. So carnivores are the most general. Um, our ruminants and our pigs are intermediate and our equine are the most specialized. Um, there's a general pattern with the carpal bones. Again, two rows, like I said before, and potentially four bones in each row. So the proximal row, again, is named. So we have a radial, an intermediate, an ulnar, an accessory. And then our distal rows are numbers. So one, two, three, and four. And that's medial to lateral. Um, note that the accessory carpal bone will always tell you um, lateral in all species. So this is our accessory bone and that will tell us um, what side we're looking at. So we're looking at laterally on this side. <clears throat> and here's all the different ones. Um, these are our carnivores on this side. So these are our cats and dogs. These are our horses and then those are our bovine. Um, they're all a little bit different. Some are fused together. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Again, she said we didn't need to know pig, um, but we need to know everything else. We need to know dogs and cows and horses. But again, here's what each look like. So here's human for reference. Here's our dog here. And then we have our horse or our horse at the end here with one over here. And then we have our ruminants here. So moving toward the fastest running animals, the number of metacarpal bones and digits decreases. So again, horse would be fast because it's only on <clears throat> one um, digit, basically. Um, so predators have the most toes, um, whereas prey have the fewest. Um, so faster animals have less digits. Like I said, that would be the horse. Um, the hunted have the fewest and the hunters have the most toes. Um, the manus of carnivores is the most general. Um, again, there's seven bones in two rows. So the proximate row has three separate bones, whereas the distal row has four separate bones. Um, so the carpal bones in dogs and cats, they are the same. Um, dogs and cat, again, have three proximal. Um, this, this is our radial and intermediate. Uh, intermediate uh, bones they fuse together into one bone called the intermedial uh, radial bone and then the distal row has the four separate bones here <laughs> um, metacarpal bones of the carnivores um, it's abbreviated MC and it's often referred to as the metacarpals um, the metacarpal bones of the carnivore, um, all five metacarpal bones are present and separate. Um, so only two through four, however, only two through four are weight bearing. Um, the digits of carnivores, um, typically there's five digits. Um, so one thumb and four fingers, basically. And then again, only two through five bear weight. Um, digits one has two phalanges, like I said before, um, and then digits two through um, five have three phalanges. So again, digit one is the dew claw, has two phalanges here. And then the cats have can have extra toes, as we know. Um, also, in cats, the distal pharynx is specialized in both form and position. They have elastic ligaments, which hold claws retracted when relaxed. Um, <clears throat> so the distal pharynx has an elast elastic ligaments, and the dorsal elastic ligament retracts the claws, um, which basically means holding the claw at rest um, so their nails aren't sticking out all the time. Um, when retracted or relaxed, P3... Um, um, lies lateral to P2. This is our fail mixes. And to protract a cat's nails, um, it has to do with the deep digital flexure. Um, this is what puts um, cat's nails out. Um, and then getting into the sesamal bones in general, small bones, these are the small bones contained within the tendon of the muscle. Um, they're used they help with modifying pressure, um, diminishing friction, and sometimes alter the direction of the pull. Um, so that these are our sesamoid bones, which are little bones in between here. 
Um, then Sesamoid Bones of the Carnivore's Manus, or Carpus. Um, the Sesamoid Bone of the Ductor Digit 1, um, it's usually visible actually radiographically. Um, it's 95% always there. So this is our Sesamoid over here. And again, usually vis visible um, radiographically. So where this red circle is, that is our Sesamoid Bone. Um... Getting into digits for sesamoid bones, um, dorsally they are tiny single roundish um, bones embedded in the common digital extensor tensions. Um, they lie at the MCP joints um, 2 through 5. So these are the little bones I showed you earlier here. <clears throat> and then palmarly, um, we have digit 1 which has tiny roundish bone and interosin tendon at the MCP joint 1. But digits two through five are paired and they're actually larger elliptical bones embedded in um, the interosseous tendons. Um, they're also visible on radiographs. <clears throat> so you can see them here. Give us lots of pictures. Okay, now getting into the manus of ruminants. Um, again, they're moder moderately specialized. Um, they have two weight-bearing digits. Um, two and three are fused, and four is separate. Um, again, three and four pre are present and are weight-bearing. Um, five is also present, and again, the green thing here, that's our accessory bone, which tells us that it's lateral. So again, a digit one is usually absent in ruminants, so they don't usually have a digit one. Um, two and three are fused, like I said, and four is separate. Um, three and four are fused and weight-bearing, so this is known as our cannon bone. Um, and five is tiny and non-weight-bearing, so they technically do have three um, bones, um, carpal bone. Oh, sorry. So the ruminant carpal bones, they have six. Um, so the proximate row, are, there's four present and separate. And then the distal row typically only has two separate bones. So again, our carpal being our wrist here, um, showing you the same picture. And then, again. Um, ruminants, three and four, again, are weight-bearing. Um, two and four. Um, two and five are non-weight bearing, so our dew claws, um, the dew claws usually have no bones as well. <clears throat> and again, three and four are weight bearing. Um, as you can see, this is what holds the ruminant up. These are just more pictures of digits and such. And again, dew claws usually, they don't have bones. These are just um, a lot more pictures of the same thing. And then getting into the manus of a horse, which is highly speci specialized because a horse is only on digit three. Um, the equine carpus um, has seven bones. It's different from the carnivores, seven bones, however. So the proximate roll are all present and separate. Um, the distal roll, um, one is present 50% of the time. It looks like a pea, um, and then two and two through four are um, consistently present. <clears throat> but again, we're gonna have to know all of these um, for our lab exam. So up here we have our radius. Then we have our radius bone is up here. And then we have our interme intermediate carpal bone, which is this one here. And then we have our ulnar carpal bone. Then we have our radial carpal bone. Um, and then we have our fourth carpal bone, our third, and our second. And then we have our fourth metacarpal bone, and then our third metacarpal bone, and then our second. So that's in the dorsal view, however. So we're gonna have to know it from the dorsal view and the palmar view. Um, equine carpal bones, um, again, it just goes through it all. Um, but again, the metacarpal bones, um, two through four are present. All are separate, at least in, the, in a young horse. Only three is a weight bearing all the way to the ground. So again, the cannon bone. And two or four are small and short. These are our splint bones, or also known as splints. Um, so here's our splint bones, like I said. 
And then our cannon bone is the big bone here. And then the equine digit, like I said, they're only standing on one digit, and that is digit three. And here's everything to do with the horse. So we have our splint bones, like I showed you before. We have our cannon bone. We have our sesamoid bones. We have our long pastern bone here. And then we have our short pastern bone. And then we have our navicular bone, which is before our coffin bone. And that was it for anatomy for today. And then we're going to go into microanatomy, so which is different, um, unfortunately. We have all these different um, things we have to learn. Um, but this has to do with um, muscle pathology. Um, so starting with muscle types, we have, again, smooth muscle. We have um, striated muscle, which includes our skeletal muscle. And then we have our cardiac muscle. So smooth muscle, um, they have sing a single nucleus that is located centrally. Um, it also lacks um, cross striation, whereas striated muscle, which includes um, skeletal muscle, um, they're multinucleated. They have cross um, striation, which are composed of um, A and I bands, and they have a peripheral nuclei. Um, and then we have our cardiac muscle, which have cross striations and a central nucleus, and they have intercalated disc. Um, so showing you pictures of these. Um, this is our smooth muscle here. So again, they have a central nucleus looking from it at, in different ways, longitudinal and then the other way. Um, you can't see any striations here, which is fine because it is smooth muscles and they don't have any striations. And then getting into our skeletal muscle here. Um, again, we can see the striations. I don't know if you guys can, but there's striations. Um, there's peripheral nuclei here. Um, and there's actually um, more than one nucleus per my myocyte. And again, getting into more um, skeletal muscles. So here's our um, A bands and our I bands that I was talking about. Um, the darker color here, this includes A bands. Um, this includes A bands where the actin and myosin overlap, creating the dark um, figure. And then the light here, these are our I bands and they do not overlap here. Um, skeletal muscle has different fiber types. They have a fiber type 1, um, which is our slow twitch fibers. They're oxidative and they are fatigue resistant. And then we have our fiber 2A, which is our fast um, twitch, our oxidative and glycolytic. Um, they are also fatigue resistant. But then we have type 2B, which is our fast twitch. Um, they are fatigue sensitive and they are um, glycosidic, glycolytic. Sorry. And then here's our cardiac muscle here. Um, here you can see a central nucleus, um, you, uh, you can see the striations, um, just like skeletal muscle. Um, and then we have the dark blue bands, um, which are indicated by the arrow here. These are our intercalated discs that I was talking about. And then getting into some uh, muscle abnormalities, we have um, congenital muscle abnormalities. Um, this is known as muscular dystrophy. Um, these are this is a group of inherited diseases, um, the progressive muscle degeneration and necrosis. Um, an example an example would be Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Um, that's a hallmark um, disease. Um, the result of mutation. Um, it's usually in young dogs, and it has, has progressive necrosis of muscle, um, and it's usually detected in early stages. <coughs> Sorry. And now getting into myotonia, um, there's actually fainting goats, which will probably make you guys laugh. Um, so this myotonia, that's what fainting goats have. Um, they have the inability of skeletal muscle to relax. So their skeletal muscle, when they get scared, tenses, and it cannot relax, causing them to just tighten up and then fall over and faint. Um, it's also inherited defects in sodium and chloride ion channel function. Um, but these... Um, goats have, are heavily muscular, um, and they are used for meat, um, but then we also have poly polysaccharide, um, storage myopathy of horses, um, thought to result from abnormal carbohydrate metabolism, how we don't really know, um, they have muscle necrosis or atrophy, and also amylopectin has to do with it too, um, 
So muscle atrophy is the decreased size of muscle and or individual myofibers. Um, the mechanisms of muscle atrophy um, are disuse, which is severe lameness. So um, if you're not doing anything for a long time, um, stop doing anything, or you have like a casted limb or something, um, disuse occurs slowly and it's not as severe as ca um, cachexia or denervation. Um, it's often asymmetrical um, and it predominantly has to do with um, type 2 fibers here. Um, cachexia has to do, is a systematic, systemic disease, sorry, um, like neoplasia, um, it has to do with starvation and malnutrition. Um, it's a metrical muscle atrophy, so, it, and it has to predominantly do with type 2 fibers, um, mobilization of protein from muscle to supply energy. And then we have denervation, um, which is normal myofiber size, depends on trophic factors from its associated nerve. Um, this is following usually nerve damage, um, so muscle atrophy occurs rapidly within weeks. Um, this is loss of type 1 and type 2 uh, muscle fibers here. And then we have <clears throat> endocrine disease, which has to do with hypothyroidism and hyperadenocorticism. Um, so hypo meaning little, too little thyroid, whereas hyper here is too much adrenal. So this is Cushing's disease disease which Cushing's disease looks like this um there's usually hair loss um they usually have a pot belly um this having to do with ACTH um but it starts with the pituitary gland um it's usually has an adenoma here which is a dying tumor of epithelial tissue um but yeah and then muscle hypertrophy hypertrophy sorry i have a hard time saying that um physiological um it has increased myofiber size due to exercise conditioning and then we have compens um compensatory um which is partially denervated muscle and then we have primary muscle abnormality which has to do with hypertrophic um cardiomyopathy <clears throat> um hypertrophic cardiomyopathy looks like this um, this is actually in cats. It's very common. Um, it's cardi cardiomegaly, which is you have a thick left ventricle wall and four septum. Uh, we have a sequel, so this leading to thrombus um, of the atrium. And we have predisposed pre breeds, um, which is our Persians, our Maine Coon cats, and our, our American short hair. It, but it's very uncommon in dogs. Um, but yeah, that is what we learned today. Um, we're going to be learning a lots of material. I still have lab today, um, but it's just as much as material as last time, so if I get to a video or not, um, kind of depends on the day. Um, but I love you guys, and I make these videos for me, so hopefully I can get them done. I'm actually doing a new way of <clears throat> learning as well. Um, I'm not converting um, all the PowerPoints to Word documents like I was doing in the past because it was just taking too much time, so I've been teaching myself OneNote. Um, so I could just put the PowerPoints in there and then take notes on top of them. So I'm hoping that's going to work out um, and I can still pass by learning um, in this new way. Um, but I haven't changed my <laughs> learning and studying style uh, ever really. So um, we'll see if it's beneficial or not. And I hope it is. Um, but I hope you guys had a good Tuesday. I hope you guys had a good weekend. Um, I miss all you guys. I'm sorry I haven't posted in a while. Um, you haven't seen my face in it, um, quite a while. Um, but I love you guys, and I hope you guys have a good rest of your day.